Open your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 18. Those of you that were here at the first service, you were able to see why Brother David had invited me to come and share with you. With what my family and I went through, and most importantly with what the Lord Jesus Christ did in delivering me and delivering my family and healing us, restoring us. I want to be able to share more on that. I know a lot of people are interested in in the Eastern arts and why we're seeing so much of the Eastern mystical uh, things coming into the church, whether it be through spiritual formation or through Tai Chi and yoga and quote-unquote Christian martial arts. So I do want to share a little bit more with you on that. So I would encourage you, you know, stay with us for fellowship dinner. And right after the dinner, uh, we'll have the floor open where you can ask questions. And by the grace of God, I'll be able to answer. The reason that this is important and why it's so important now in the times that we're living. Revelation chapter 18, verse 1 And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. There's two cities that are mentioned more than any other in Scripture. What are they? Babylon, and what's the other one? Okay, what's another name for Jerusalem? Zion. Many Christians out there, when they talk about Jerusalem or when they hear about Jerusalem, they think of a place over in the Middle East. But if you go to Daniel chapter 9, verse 19, look this up on your own. Daniel actually tells us who Jerusalem is. It says, Thy people and thy city which are called by thy name. Yerushalam. It means the city of peace, shalom. We are to have that peace with Christ. So when we look at Babylon, it's not just Rome. You have Zion, which is God's people, God's city, and you have the rest of the world. He says, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And verse 4, he tells us, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. God wants us to come out and be separate from the world Because he doesn't want us to become the habitation of devils. Have you ever considered the fact that at this time, this is the time when the latter rain is being poured out? And that's that's starting to happen now, I believe. We're seeing the drops of the latter rain falling all over the world right now. This is not something 20 years or the next generation. This is now. If you're watching the news, if you're keeping up with what's taken place just since January in Rome, it will floor you. We are seeing the floor is already there. They've already, the structure's built. It's just behind the curtain. Many, many Christians are saying, yeah, but we know this still has to happen and we still have this that has to happen. Even Seventh-day Adventists are saying, yes, but we still have so much that has to happen. We don't. It's already in place. They've built everything behind the scenes and they've just got a veil in front of it. And when they're ready, they're going to drop the veil and it's there. It'll come as an overwhelming surprise. But what really struck struck me about this verse is it says, Babylon has become the habitation of devils. From what we read in the scripture, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, there will only be two types of people. One person will be filled with the Spirit of the living God. They will have the mind of Christ and the heart of Christ. The other group of people will be possessed, literally. That's what it says. They are the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit. Now I want to give you some examples. 
<clears throat> I had never really considered um, spiritual warfare or, or the attacks that the enemy, you know, throws at us, except for thinking that, well, Satan's on the outside of the church and he's throwing rocks and tomatoes at us. He's on the outside of my house and he's, you know, he attacks us. He, he does little things, causes annoyances. But I did not take into account what the scripture says, what Jesus says, and what Ellen White says. She says, every mind is either under the control of the Spirit of God or they're under the control of demons. Every mind. There is no middle ground. The Bible says that we were built, we were created to be the temple of the living God. We were created to be His dwelling place. And Satan said, I'm going to set my throne in your temple. Not some place in Jerusalem. And it may really happen, but that's only a symbol. He's talking about Satan wants to set his throne inside of our hearts and our minds. So how does he do that? I'm going to give you a couple of examples. True story. A number of years ago when my wife and I um, were being set free, and we were seeking help from anybody out there, it doesn't matter what denomination they were. We wanted somebody that knew the Lord and knew the gospel. That, we, that Jesus came to set the captives free. And we had, um, we had a gentleman and his wife that shared something with us. There was a couple, Christian couple. Both of them had been previously married. Both of them, they had their spouse cheat on them and abandon them. So according to God's word, they had every right to remarry. They were, they were right in God's eyes. The lady had a little boy, approximately five or six years old, and the gentleman had a little daughter, a little bit older. The little boy was cold. Like if, uh, if the mother reached to pick him up, I mean, he was like he would stiffen up. Have you ever hugged somebody? And it was like you could feel it. There was a, they were tight. There wasn't any warmth. They didn't relax. Have you ever hugged somebody like that? Or have you ever shook hands with somebody and you could tell they didn't really want to shake your hand? Well, if the father would pick this little boy up, he would do the same thing. It was just like he would sit, but it was like he would become very tense. And you knew he was, he was not comfortable. He was not happy. He had no joy. And they had went through this for years and couldn't figure out what the problem was. And they asked somebody for help that knew about the Lord's command to set the captives free. And these people, they asked the mother and the father questions. And come to find out, the mother's former husband um, was not a Christian. He was involved with some, some bad, bad things, bad sins. And these sins had opened his life up so that he literally was... Not the habitation of God, but the habitation of the enemy. And I'm not talking about, you know, your head spinning around backwards and throwing up. I'm talking about he just wasn't living for God. And when he had left, do you know what came into that little boy? A spirit of rejection. Type into Ellen White, into her encyclopedia or into her, uh, her CD-ROM. Look, at, look that up. Look up the word spirit and devils and find out how many that she names by name. A spirit you know by its character. Everybody in the Bible, they were named based on their character. So this couple, they knew this little boy, a spirit of rejection came into him. Do you know what normally follows a spirit of rejection? Bitterness. Bitterness. When someone feels rejected, they do one of two things normally. Either they withdraw, they become like reclusive, down. Like you'll see people sometimes and they're walking and, and they're like this. And then sometimes you'll see people and, and they're very angry, they're very aggressive. That can be the two extremes. When someone feels rejection, either it'll be reclusive, they'll withdraw, or they'll become angry and bitter. And I know that from experience because that happened in my life. But this little boy, this spirit would whisper, and you, he, you, you couldn't hear him. The little boy didn't say he could hear a voice. 
But how many times do we hear a voice speaking in our head, but it's our voice? It sounds like us. So this little boy would hear all these bad things that had happened about how his dad didn't love him and his dad had left his mom and his mom rejected him because she didn't stay with his dad and fight hard enough. So the little boy became very bitter and angry and he could not accept love. When someone tried to hug him, this spirit would cause him to, to tighten up. They prayed for that little boy. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, because Christ said so, they claimed the blood of Jesus Christ over that little boy. They confessed the bitterness that the little boy felt on his behalf. The Bible says we can do that. How many times did Moses confess the sins of all his ancestors and all the nation of Israel? The Bible says we are a kingdom of priests. Do you know that you can do that? You can confess and intercede on behalf of someone who may not be interceding on their own behalf. And the Lord will work miracles. That's why we have a great high priest. He takes our confession and he carries it to the Father. They confessed and they claimed by faith the blood of Jesus Christ over that little boy. And they cut the ties, the spiritual ties to his earthly father because he did not want anything to do with the little boy. They said, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, we're severing that tie to his biological father. And we are joining him to this new husband so that he can be the spiritual father of this little boy. Do you know when they got up off of their knees, that little boy jumped up into that man's lap and hugged him and was a completely different person. He had not been able to do that since they had gotten married. That's a miracle. That's what, that's what our Savior is willing and able and desires to do for each of us today. My, my wife and I, when we... Um, when we were getting back together, when we were working on things, we had, we had moved back in, which I shouldn't have done until we had gotten legally married again. But I didn't know. The Lord works with us where we are. He's so merciful. But we were living back in the same apartment, and we were, we were working and praying, and we were getting counsel and advice from God-fearing people that were helping us. And we got remarried, and yet we were still battling. I was still battling. And I asked, I asked my wife and children, I said, why don't we all pray? It was a Sunday morning. I said, why don't we kneel down this morning together as a family? Why don't we go to the Lord? Why don't we ask Him? He knows what's causing, causing this tension, this battle, these struggles that we're having. Why don't we ask Him? Because I don't know what it is. And I was having some issues with my son, um, a little bit of rebellion. And, you know, children go through stages but that doesn't mean it's right and it's of God. And I, I, I was praying for him, but we all prayed. Even my son, he prayed, Lord, you show me if there's anything in my life that's causing this. My wife prayed, my daughter prayed, I prayed. And we all got up, my wife and children, you know, they had to run some errands and do some things. And I sat down to work on, uh, on getting our website up for our ministry. And that afternoon... My son came home, my wife and daughter, and he went running upstairs as soon as he walked in the door. And we could hear him. I didn't know what he was doing. He comes downstairs carrying this huge box of toys. And he looked at me, and he was probably eight years old now, eight, nine years old. He said, the Lord told me to get rid of these. And I looked what was in the box, and it was a toy that was called Bionicles. It's made by Lego. Have any of y'all ever heard that? They're Legos. I grew up with Legos. I was like, why, why would God tell you to get rid of Bionicles? This is my little boy. And my wife, um, and women sometimes are a little bit different than us men. Men are looking for the dangers. Women are more like looking for, okay, what's for dinner? Um, how do I provide you know, clothing for our family? The men are looking for the bad things. My wife is like, Eric, we're not getting rid of those toys. You spent a lot of money. Legos are expensive. We're not throwing those away. She said, Connor, take those back upstairs. I said, wait a minute. I said, honey, I said, let's give it a minute. I said, I really felt like the Lord had told him this. He prayed that morning, and apparently that day the Lord had told him, that's what you need to get rid of. So my son and I sat down, and we got on the internet, and I typed in Bionicles. Had never looked them up before. Guess where the names of every one of those characters in those Lego toys come from? Polynesian gods of rebellion. 
almost every single one of those toys that I had paid big money for was named after a Polynesian false god, a demon, a fallen angel. And many of them, not all of them, many of them were actually, when you looked at the description of them, they were rebellious. And I knew. I showed it to my wife and she went, oh my. The Lord did tell him to get rid of those. My son, I said, you do it. He went outside, dumped every one of them in the trash, walked out, and it changed him. Doesn't mean we didn't have discussions after that, but it, it freed him from something that had a right to attack him. When we look at the battle, the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, right? But against what? Spiritual wickedness in high places. Principalities and powers. When my wife and I were, were having arguments before the divorce, I would come home and maybe my wife would, you know, she would be frustrated with something and she'd start fussing. And you know what I would hear? I would literally hear this in my mind. And all of us have done this. But it was my voice. I heard it in my own voice. She always does that. Man, here we go again. We got to do this again. Man, I just, I'm so tired. This is what I was hearing in my own voice. Do you understand? And do you know what my wife would hear in her voice? What's wrong with him? He doesn't care about you. Why won't he ever listen to you? Why is he acting that way? It wasn't until we were set free that we learned that those weren't our voices. What makes you think that the devil can't speak in your own voice? So what I have to do is I have to say, Lord, is this thought line up with your word? Is this thought of anger or of bitterness or of selfishness or of pride, or whatever that thought or intemperance, does this line up with your word? And that doesn't mean every thought that pops into your head is the devil. But, you know, they had that little cartoon with a good angel on one shoulder and a bad angel on the other. How many angels were cast out of heaven? How many billions do you think are still there now? Don't think for a minute that there's not probably at least one fallen angel for every human being on the face of the earth. And they know our history. They know my father's sins. They know my mother's sins. And they communicate. Ellen White said they work like an army. They are setting us up every day to try to take us down, to pull us away from Christ, to cause us to stumble and fall. So you say, how can you fight such an immense enemy? How can anybody possibly overcome? He tells us, the Lord tells us, in 1 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 10, You'll turn there with me. Actually, 2 Corinthians 10. I apologize. 2 Corinthians 10. He says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That means they're not flesh and blood. But they are mighty. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down the imaginations, those thoughts that run through your mind, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowing of God. It says knowledge of God. The word in the Greek is knowing of God. John chapter 17 says this is life eternal, that we might know Him. Right? And bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. There's a word there. It says, the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. A stronghold is what? Give me an example. What's a stronghold? A fortress. When an army decides to go in and take over a new country, you can't take over the whole country all in one swoop. So what they do is, is they plant a stronghold inside the borders inside your house, inside your life. They put a stronghold there. They get their foot in the door. 
And once they get their foot in the door, they say, I'm not, letting this, I'm not losing this stronghold. Do you understand what I'm saying? How a stronghold is built is you lay one block upon another. What the devil does is he lies to you. He lies to man. The Bible says the devil is a liar and the father of lies. So what he does is, is he'll take a little girl when maybe she's five years old and he'll say, nobody likes you, you're ugly. And then when she goes to school, and she's really a beautiful little girl, she goes to school and somebody at school, some little boy who's not a Christian and doesn't realize it, the devil will whisper in his ear, she's ugly, and he'll speak those words. You're ugly, you're fat. There's another block that's laid. And then somebody else, when she gets to high school, will make fun of her because of her braces, and another block is laid. Do you understand? And now she's 35 or 40 years old, and she has a wall that is built around her that's keeping her from experiencing God's love as well as other people's loves because of the lies that the devil has said over and over and over again through us. So how do you tear down a wall that is made with lies? With the truth. With the truth of God's Word. Jesus Christ said, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And whom the Son makes free is free indeed. So when I hear a voice in my mind that says, Your wife doesn't really care about you. She was gone all day and she didn't even call or she didn't come home at the time when you wanted her to be here. The first thing I've got to do is, is I've got to say, Lord, you say that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You say that I am loved with an everlasting love. You say what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. That's why Jesus said, hide my word in your heart. Read it and he will put it there. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. Imaginations is vain thoughts. It's thoughts that aren't true. A lot of times people will feel ugly, so they'll put on things to make them not feel ugly. A lot of times people will feel rejected, so they'll try to gain attention so that they don't feel rejected. What Jesus did was he looked past the cigarette and he looked inside the heart to see what's, why is that man hurting? The cigarette's not the issue. It's what's inside the heart. If I can fix the heart, the cigarettes will disappear. Do you understand? I'm going to share something personal with you. I have struggled since I was a little boy with intemperance with food. I don't know where it came from. It was an idol. Whenever I felt um, angry, I'd go eat. Whenever I felt rejected, I'd go eat. Whenever I felt let down, I would go. And I didn't realize until a few years ago, that was my idol. Instead of going and getting on my knees and getting in front of God's Word and asking Him for help, I would run to the food. And you know what was sad? The food would make me feel good while I was eating it, and afterwards it never made me feel good. I always felt worse. When I was in high school, my friend and I used to, um, we used to go to Mr. Gaddy's Pizza and we would eat their buffet. You could eat all you wanted. And between the two of us, we could put down three or four pizzas by ourselves. And I thought this was the way I was supposed to be living. But do you know that when I gave my appetite to the Lord, and I tell them, I tell them every meal, when I'm praying over that meal now, I'm not just saying a prayer. Dear Lord, bless this food. Thank you. Amen. Father, I give my appetite to you. You help me to stop eating when I'm supposed to stop eating. You give me your victory, Jesus. Give me your victory over appetite. And he gives it the moment you ask him in faith. It says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Those are those demons, those evil spirits, those fallen angels. And it says, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Let this mind be in us which was in Christ Jesus. How does that happen? I need you all to help me. Give me some feedback. How does that happen? How do I have the mind of Christ? He already promised it. So it's done. 
So what that means is, is I've got to thank him for it. So I go to God and I say, dear God, I need to ask you to forgive me for, for a certain sin. I lost my temper this morning. I was impatient with my children or my wife. Um, I watched something on television I really shouldn't have watched. Or I turned on some music I shouldn't have listened to. God, please forgive me. And then I'm waiting for what? Do I wait until I feel like I've been forgiven? Because the devil's going to do everything he can to control my feelings. What I do is I say, what does God's word say? I have forgiven you of all your iniquities. I have healed you of all your diseases. I go to God's word and I find where he's promised my forgiveness. And I say, thank you. Father, you promised it. I ask you in faith. I've confessed. I've repented. I take what you've given to me. If my son gets up in the morning and he's on his way out to school and he says, Dad, will you make me, will you make me lunch? I need lunch for today. And I say, I already made it for you. I got up an hour earlier. I made your lunch and sitting on the counter. Five minutes later, he comes out of the bathroom. He says, Dad, I've got to leave in a couple minutes. Would you make me lunch for today? I say, Connor, it's on the counter. I've already made it for you. Two minutes later, he comes back after he's got his jacket and his school bag. He says, Dad, I need a lunch today. Would you make lunch for me? I say, son, I already made it. Why are you begging me for something that I've already done? Why are we begging God to do for us that which has already been accomplished in the life and the death and the glorious resurrection of His Son, Christ Jesus? The only thing that can stop us from taking hold of those promises is doubt. And what causes us to doubt? If we fall. If I fall or if I struggle, if the devil can keep me looking at me, looking at my sins and my failures and my weakness, instead of looking at his victory, his power, and his love, then I doubt. Do you know the Bible says that faith worketh by love? It's not me loving him that makes faith work. It's me knowing that he loves me that makes my faith work. Because if I know that I'm loved even when I was yet dead in my sins, if he was willing to forgive me when I was wretched, how much more will he forgive me today? When I was 14 years old, I was as lost as lost can be. When I was 29, I was as lost as lost can be. If he paid for me 2,000 years ago, how many sins did Christ carry 2,000 years ago? That's one of those places where you could give me an idea. How many sins did Christ carry 2,000 years ago? All of whose? Say mine. That means, did he, did he pay just for sins or did he pay for iniquities and transgressions? All. He carried the sins of every human being. How long ago was that? Over 2,000 years ago. So why do I still want to hold on to that today? Why am I still struggling to believe that He'll forgive me? It's already been done. The moment I go to Him and I confess it to Him, the page is wiped clean. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Starting with verse 10. There's a promise here. Listen to what he says. He says, by the which will. And that will is like a last will and testament or a living will. By the which will, a predetermined you know, decision of what's going to be done. We are sanctified. Is our past tense, present tense, or future tense? The word are. Present. 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 Um, the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He said, I am. Is that past, present, or future? Present. present. What is the name that we're going to have written in our foreheads? Christ. I am. I am what? I am forgiven. Why? Because Jesus said so. I am clean. Why? Because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth me from all sin. I am healed. Why? Because I can give you three places right off the top of my head. He says, I sent my word and healed them. 
I forgive all their iniquities. I heal all their diseases. And Isaiah 53 says, by his stripes, we were healed. I can say I am healed of my diseases because he says it. I am set free from sin. Why? Because he says so. When you're reading through the New Testament, especially even the Old Testament, look at the tense of the verbs. Christ was the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. By the which will, we are sanctified. We are made holy through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices over and over again, which can never take away sins. If I had committed adultery back in uh, Elijah's day or Jeremiah's day, what would I have had to do? I'd have to go to the priest. I'd have to bring a lamb. I'd have to confess to this priest who knows everybody in Israel and tell him, say, you're not going to believe what I did. I committed adultery on my wife. What, the, what shame and guilt. And then I've got to bring this lamb that would be like, um, a lamb would be like a motorcycle or a small automobile. Money-wise, that's what it was like. I had to bring this thing that I've raised and paid a lot of money for, and I've got to take my hand and cut its throat. And that priest then takes that blood and spills it into a basin, and he sprinkles that blood inside the sanctuary, and he sprinkles that blood in before the veil. And he confesses on my behalf, Father, he's done what you said. He's confessed, and he brought this lamb. You promised him that if he would do this, you would forgive him. The priest would come back out of the sanctuary after doing that, and you know what the priest would say? He, had said, he would tell me, Eric, you've been forgiven. Now, I've got to walk home and I've got to go, I don't feel forgiven. How do I know that I've been forgiven? Because God said, if I brought this lamb and if I did these certain rituals, he would forgive me. I've got to go home justified by faith that God will do what he's promised. How much more will God forgive to the uttermost those that claim the blood of the Lamb of God over a dumb animal? But this man, verse 12, Christ Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting, waiting until his enemies be made his footstool. Now I want you to look this up when you get home. Verse 14. It says, For by one offering he hath perfected forever those that are sanctified. Right there in verse 10 to verse 14, it says by one sacrifice, and then it says by one offering. It's two different Greek words. The sacrifice is what he did on Calvary. The offering is what he did every single day of his life when he was here. It says we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy unto God. Christ did that. He never fell to sin one time, and that's what He freely gives to us. He says, my death is your death, but my life I give to you today. Today, if we will hear His voice, He says, harden not your hearts like they did in the wilderness. Then in verse 15 he says, Whereof the Holy Spirit also is a witness to us. Us being given the gift of the Holy Spirit is a witness that God has already accepted the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. For after that he had said before, look at verse 16. This is a quote from the Old Testament from Jeremiah. This is the covenant, the oath and the promise that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins, I want you all to read this with me out loud. Read verse 17. And their sins and iniquities will I... What does that mean? What does it mean he will remember them no more? Do you know what it says? It quotes that all through Isaiah. King David said that. O oh Lord... If my iniquities were marked before thee, who could stand? 
He said, your iniquities, when you confess them, I wash them away. He's not going to look at you in the judgment and bring up to you everything that you've ever done. It's gone. If you've confessed it, it's gone. It was buried with Christ 2,000 years ago. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 52. And hold your finger there. There's one other place I want to go first. Isaiah 52 and Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Starting with verse 6. The Bible talks about we're saved by faith. The servant of the Lord said in the last days... The third angel's message is what? Righteousness by faith in verity. You can be righteous by faith. Now faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, right? I can be righteous by faith, but faith has to come from the word of God. So righteousness is by God speaking it. Does that make sense? Listen to what he says. But the righteousness which is by faith speaketh on this wise. And he's talking to you and I today. Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down again from above. If I've sinned today, do I need to bring Jesus down again today to die for me again? Or verse 7. Who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? the righteousness which is of faith. What does it say? The word is nigh unto thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. And that is the word of faith which we preach. What is this word of faith? That if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be delivered, set free, rescued, healed, and made whole. When I read this for the first time, it says, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. What does that mean to confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus? To confess that Jesus is Lord. I'm going to put this up there. This is important. I want you all to look at this. When you look in the Old Testament, you'll see capital L-O-R-D. When you look in the New Testament, you see the same thing. But when you look at this word in the New Testament as well as in the Old, in the Old Testament, the word was Adonai. Do you know what that word means in the Hebrew as well as in the Greek? It means the sovereign king. When you say the Lord Jesus, you're saying He reigns today in my life. He reigns. When you wonder when you're reading the Gospels, how did the disciples go around healing the sick? Remember Peter and John? They came into the temple and there's that lame man begging at the door of the temple. You remember the words that Peter said to him? We don't have money. But such as I, as I have, give I thee. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. And he reached out and he took him by the hand and he lifted him up. In the name of the sovereign king, Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. When Peter said in the name, it wasn't just words. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. I'm doing this in his name. Jesus said, as much as you have done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. So when you're talking to your friends and your neighbors, or you're talking to somebody on the street, it's Christ in you that's speaking to them. So in the authority of His Word, you can say in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Not because I'm forgiving you, but because He has forgiven you. Does that make sense? Verse 10, it says, For with the heart 
Man believes unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Jesus tells us, I can believe it in my heart, but if I'm afraid to speak it, it shows that I'm ashamed of His word. And He said, whosoever is ashamed of my word, I'm going to be ashamed of them in the day of judgment. With our heart we believe, but with our mouth we have to confess. That means to speak out loud, to profess. He is the high priest of our profession, of what we speak. So when I go to God on my knees and I'm begging and I don't have any faith, what does Jesus have to take to the Father? He's the high priest. He can only take to the Father what I've spoken. When I go to Jesus and I pray in the Spirit, it means I'm praying in His Word. I take His Word and I say, Lord, You promised this. I'm helpless. I'm weak. I'm undone. I have no way to overcome. But You swore to me and You cannot lie. And you know what Christ does? It says He sings over us. Can you imagine Jesus in heaven singing over us in our weakness? What does it sound like? When He spoke, the universe was created. What happens when He sings? Can you imagine what it sounds like when the Son of Almighty God is singing? Hallelujah! And He's singing over us. And I'm going to read that to you in a moment. It says, For with the heart we believe unto righteousness, and with our mouth confession is made unto salvation, unto deliverance. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on Him, on Him, the Word of God, shall not be ashamed. He will not put you to shame. If you've trusted in Him, He will not let you be put to shame. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. And then verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm going to read quickly a couple of statements. And if you're interested in any of these statements, come up and get the information afterward. Let me give you a way to contact us where I can send things to you by email. This is from Ministry of Healing. Not alone upon the mountaintop with Jesus and hours of spiritual illumination is the life of Christ's servants to be spent. There is work for them down in the plain. Souls whom Satan has enslaved are waiting for the word of faith and prayer to set them free. Through his servants, God designs that the sick, the unfortunate, and those possessed by evil spirits shall hear his voice. Through his human agencies, he desires to be a comforter such as the world knows not. Think about what that means. When you're talking to the lady at the checkout at the grocery store and you can look on her face and you know something's wrong. Instead of being afraid, reach out and take her hand and tell her, say, the Lord loves you and he wants you to know that today. When you drive through the, the teller at the bank, tell her of the Lord's power. Share with them what the Lord has done in your life. When the police officer pulls you over because you got a ticket, Talk to Him. We are in, every one of us are, are light shining in a world of darkness and people are waiting to hear the word of faith. The word of faith. Last year, we run our ministry by faith. We don't charge for anything. Everything we do is by faith. We mail out free books, free DVDs, and we started doing that because we heard a message from Gospel Ministries International, David Gates. And I said, you know, I believe. I believe what he said. And I told my wife, I said, I want to go down and I want to meet him because sometimes you can see somebody behind the screen or on a pulpit and you don't know if that's the real person. And we went down there numerous times and he's the real thing. He lives exactly, we saw his house, met his family, we ate dinner with, we saw he lives exactly how he preaches. And he said, if you'll trust the Lord and you'll be willing to spend everything to get the gospel out, he'll provide for you. But if you've only got $100 and you're holding on to 90 of it, God's not going to send you another 100 because you've still got 90 that you haven't used. So one day I was there at the house and the enemy began attacking me. 
We were low on food. I had one roll of toilet paper left through the household. One roll. I knew my wife's going to be home this afternoon, and she's not going to be happy about that. Um, I had very little food left in the house. Um, for me, I eat a raw diet, so I had very little left that I could eat. My family was good. And the enemy started whispering in my ear, in my voice, you know, where's God at? Why is he forsaken you? And then the Lord, I heard his word say, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And then I heard the devil say, yeah, but you don't have any food. You've only got one roll of toilet paper. Your wife's not going to be happy. God's word said, I will provide all your needs according to my riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So this battle was going on. I was hearing both voices. And I thought, I'm going to walk down to the mailbox. Maybe somebody sent us a gift in the mail. Sometimes that happens. So I'm walking down to the mailbox and I could still hear the devil whispering, accusing, telling me that Christ is not going to do what he promised to do. And all of a sudden, instead of hearing the Lord's voice, the Lord turned my head. And I looked over to the side and we've got horses that the, the neighbors keep. They've got like a, a horse corral right near us. I looked over there and there's this horse in the corral. And I'm looking at him and you know what he's doing? Tell me what this horse was doing. He was eating grass. And you know what the Lord spoke in my mind? That horse eats the same thing every meal, every day of its life, and he's happy. And then you know what came flashing back to my mind? The children of Israel. I'm sick of this manna. I'm so tired of manna. The Bible said they loathed this light bread. And I thought, oh, Father, forgive me. I'm doing the exact same thing. Here I am complaining. That horse isn't complaining. He's, he loves it. And then another word came from the Lord. You don't live by, bre by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And I got down, you know, and then I was encouraged. I felt better. I was like, thank you, Lord. And I got down to the mailbox. I opened it up, and there's nothing in there but bills. <laughs> and, and then the enemy came in again, like a flood. Where do the promises go now? There's nothing here. God has forsaken you. And I started walking back up to the house, kind of with my head down. And you know what the Lord said? All of a sudden, this beautiful picture <laughs> came to my mind. The children of Israel are out in the middle of a desert. They're in a desert. They don't have crops. They don't have any way of getting food. There's no grocery store. And God said, I'm going to send you bread from the sky. I'm going, to, I'm going to throw loaves of bread down to you from the sky. And the Lord was like, it just impressed me. And I looked up to heaven and I said, if you threw bread down from the sky, can you not throw money down from the sky? What's the difference? Money is just paper. It's just paper. It's monopoly money. A hundred dollar bill is monopoly money. I said, praise you, Lord. Thank you. And the Lord said, that's where the victory comes. Start praising me. Don't keep asking me. You've already asked me. Start thanking me for it. So I started thanking him. You know, I went in the house. I had one apple left. I had a handful of almonds and I had some honey that was raw. So I took that apple. The Lord just gave me this idea. I took that apple. I cut it up, put it in a blender. I added the handful of almonds that I had left. I put a big tablespoon of honey, added a little bit of water. I blended it up. It was the best bowl of food that I think I'd ever eaten. And I was happy because I was thinking about that horse. You know, the next day I went down to the mailbox. And I, on the way down there, the Lord said, thank me. I started thanking him. And I got to the mailbox and there was money sent to provide for what we needed that day. And you know what? I'm learning every day to live that way. And you know what? It's going to be so much easier when the time of trouble comes because our faith is already there. It was by the word of God that Christ overcame the, the wicked one. She says in Desire of Ages, page 258, history is repeating with the Bible open before them and professing to reverence its teachings, many of the religious leaders of our time are destroying faith in the Bible as the Word of God. They busy themselves with dissecting the Word and they set their own opinions above its plainest statements. In their hands, God's Word loses its regenerating power. And this is why iniquity is rife or so widespread. Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 52. We're going to close with this verse. I have people that call the house. There's people that email us because they want help. 
And sometimes, you know, I'll look at the phone and I know when I look at that number, I go, I know who this is. I'm like, Lord, I'm not feeling so well today. I don't know if I can be enthusiastic. And, and my faith, I'm struggling with my faith right now. And the Lord's like, Eric, it's not your faith. It's my word that does the miracle. Amen. And I'll tell people, they'll say, I know it says that, but, 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 listen to what this says and read this for yourself. Isaiah 52. He says, awake, awake. Put on thy strength, O Zion. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. He has called us holy. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee. Is he talking about spirits here? The uncircumcised and the unclean. How many unclean spirits did Jesus cast out in the Gospels? How many unclean spirits is he willing to cast out today? He says today, shake thyself from the dust. Remember Mary Magdalene when they threw her at Jesus' feet in the dirt? Shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down. Sit with me in heavenly places. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus saith the Lord... Ye have sold yourselves for naught, but ye shall be redeemed without money. In Abraham Lincoln's day, there were plantations everywhere, especially in this part of the country, in the south. Huge plantations run by sometimes good men, good women, sometimes not so good. Hundreds of slaves. And Abraham Lincoln... Up north, he signs a document that says all those slaves are now free. What was that document called? The Emancipation Proclamation. Well, these slaves down here at this plantation, we'll say right over the hill, two miles from here, the slaves at that plantation, they can't read. They've not been educated. The plantation owner, he gets a notice because he's educated, and he says, huh, that's Abe Lincoln. He's, he's way up north. I've been running this plantation for 200 years. My family's built this place with our own hands. We're not getting rid of any slaves. He wads up that piece of paper and he throws it in the fire. They'll never know the difference. And one day, a man who is on fire for the Lord, he comes riding through and he's got the glad tidings. And he rides up to that plantation and he sees all those slaves, all of us that are struggling in bondage and sin. And he comes up to one of the slaves and the, the man is, he's using a pick and he's digging and he's shoveling and he's covered in sweat and he's got chains on his hands and on his feet. And he comes up to him and he says, My brother, what are you doing slaving away? You have been made free. And he says, I don't know who you are, but I'm not free. Look at, these look at these chains that are on my hands. My master is still up at the house. He says, you've been made free. He says, how can you tell me that? The man says, I have the Word. I have the Word that sets you free. And that man, that slave looks at that and he says, Sir, I can't read. You read Romans chapter 8 and Romans chapter 10. How shall they know except one is sent? And how shall they be sent unless, you know, they've got the gospel? And this man says, let me read to you what that says. This is signed by the president, by the sovereign king, and it's signed in blood. Whom the Son has set free is free is free today you don't have to wait until later you don't have to go through a ritual you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you are free and that man looks at his chains after hearing the word of the living God and he says they're an illusion they're a lie I am free I am free 
I'm going to read one last verse to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We then, as workers together with Him, we beseech you also that you receive not the grace, the mercy, and the power of God in vain. For He saith, I have heard thee. I've already heard your cry. In a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee, or rescued thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. I pray that you will open your Bibles and read them with new eyes. Don't look to the future for something to happen in your life. Ask the Lord to show you His promises. Get online and look for help. There's many people there. There's promises there. There's some good audio CDs by a Seventh-day Adventist evangelist years ago, he's dead now, named Glenn Kuhn, called the ABCs of Prayer. Powerful messages. And you can, you can listen to all of them free on the internet. And if you need a CD of them, ask me. I'll be happy to mail it to you for free. Let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for what you have done. Father, I thank you for your word. We thank you. You have told us in Isaiah 55 that your word has gone forth and it shall not return unto you void, but it will accomplish that whereunto you have sent it. Father, you are not a man that you should lie, neither the son of man that you should change your mind. Father, your word is yea and amen in Christ Jesus. We thank you. And we thank you for the freedom, for the victory, for the healing, for the deliverance. We thank you for the salvation of our children and our lost loved ones. Father, we claim the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ over each of our prayer requests and over each individual that is here. Father, we confess our sins, our iniquities, and all of our transgressions. We cast them at Your feet. We are helpless without You. But Father, we thank You that we are more than conquerors through Christ that loves us. We thank You, Father. We ask for Your blessing today. In Jesus' name, we thank You and we do receive it. Amen.